During the summer, we are sampling the Psalms. Today's Psalm is Psalm 19. This Psalm is a form of poetry, and over the course of this summer, we will be pairing more modern poems with the poems of scripture to remind us the ways in which the story of God's love plays out across time. So listen as I share with you a Chinook blessing litany. We call upon the earth, our planet home, with its beautiful depths and soaring heights, its vitality and abundance of life. And together we ask that it teach us and show us the way. We call upon the mountains, the Cascades and the Olympics, the high green valleys and meadows filled with wildflowers, the snows that never melt, the summits of intense silence, and we ask that they teach us and show us the way. We call upon the waters that rim the earth, horizon to horizon, the flow in our rivers and streams that fall upon our gardens and fields, and we ask that they teach us and show us the way. We call upon the land which grows our food, the nurturing soil, and the fertile fields, the abundant gardens and orchards, and we ask that they teach us and show us the way. We call upon the forests, the great trees reaching strongly to the sky with the earth in their roots and the heavens in their branches, the fir and the pine and the cedar, and we ask them to teach us and show us the way. We call upon the creatures of the fields and forests and the seas and our brothers and sisters, the wolves and deer, the eagle and dove, the great whales and the dolphin, the beautiful orca and salmon who share our Northwest home. And we ask them to teach us and show us the way. We call upon all those who have lived on this earth our ancestors and our friends, our dreamed, who dreamed the best for future generations and upon whose lives our lives are built. And we ask thanksgiving, we call upon them to teach us and show us the way. And lastly, we call upon all that we hold most sacred, the presence and power of the great spirit of love and truth, which flows through all the universe to be with us, to teach us, and show us the way. Good morning. Good morning. I am Kathy Peterson. I am a longtime member of this church and served on staff for a bit. To those of you who have been here for a while, I am so grateful to have shared a significant part of my faith journey with you. And for those of you who are relatively new to this community, you have found a treasure. May you be as enriched and upheld by this community as I have been. There. <laughs> When Melissa invited me to choose a psalm on which to preach, I thought, yay, there are so many to choose from. And my next thought was, whoa, there are so many to choose from. But after some prayer and study, I chose Psalm 19. So listen for and hear the word of God. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. 
The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can detect one's own errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There are a variety of themes in Psalms. As Melissa said earlier, there's lament, the most common theme, psalms of praise, psalms that tell the story of God's people. But the psalms that call to my heart are creation hymns. These nurture the soil of my soul. When I say them or sing them, it is as though my loved ones and ancestors are joining the song. You see, I am a cradle Presbyterian. I was raised knowing Sundays were for church, family, and the friends we call family. I went to Sunday school, worship, I sang in the choir, I was part of the core of the youth group. I know the stories, the prayers, the creeds, and the doctrines. But with all of this church stuff, my faith, this lifelong dance with God, was planted and nurtured and grown at the small farm we called home. If I woke up early enough and managed to tiptoe quietly down the creaky stairs, I would find mom sipping coffee at the kitchen sink while she watched the sunrise from the east facing window. There was always an invitation to climb up on the counter and quietly enjoy the show. And though she never said anything about God in these moments, I knew sunrise was sacred because it was the only time that mom was still and quiet and giving her full attention to something beyond the needs of home and family. At sunset, my sisters and I would sometimes gather on the top of the hill near the walnut tree and try to match our countdown to the sinking sun. And then we'd applaud the finale of another day. I learned the joy of sacred rhythms. Dad was blatantly overt in pointing out how God is revealed in creation. As one of five siblings, it was always a treat to spend alone time with Dad. On one such occasion, we were walking in the woods after a storm, taking note of fallen limbs and trees. He called me to a large tree that had fallen years before, and we looked closely at countless insects and worms and colorful toadstools and the way that the once majestic tree was becoming soil that held and nurtured the saplings and seeds it had dropped over its lifetime. This was my most memorable lesson about the life-giving interconnectedness of God's design and the cycle of life, death, and resurrection. These are just snippets about how creation became a sacred text for me I could go on about creatures and planting and harvest and don't even get me started on the moon and the stars. <laughs> this sense of wonder that was nurtured in my childhood has been a lifelong companion. And while it's delightful to get out and be in nature, appreciate its beauty and vastness and intricacies, I treasure the spiritual practice of reading creation. One day, a few years back, I went for a walk in one of my favorite parks, not far from here. This was not about raising my heart rate or getting in all my steps. It was about slowly moving through this beautiful place with God, a heavy heart, and the power of wonder. I engaged all my senses, 
took stock of all that I saw, heard, smelled, even tasting a sweet drop of honeysuckle. I touched bark, leaves, and I probably pocketed a pine cone or a rock. This particular day, the swallows caught my attention. More friendly than usual, they seemed to dive and swoop and dip around me with their lovely song. Companions as I moved along the path, a simple gift from God. Space for gratitude opened up in my heart. Curious, I discovered that swallows are symbols of hope, renewal of life, and a totem for mothers in sorrow. I wept. I do that when I sense the presence of the Holy Spirit. Poets, artists, naturalists, indigenous people, and folks like you and I have been reading creation in this way since the beginning of time. Now there is a name for it. As Lectio Divina is the sacred reading of text, the sacred reading of creation is called Creatio Divina. There is a rich history of Christians viewing wilderness as sacred. In his Summa Theologica, Thomas Aquinas writes of creation, when all parts function in relation to one another in innately appropriate ways as intended by God, the universe is indeed perfect, reflects God's goodness, and manifests God's glory. Elizabeth Theokratov, a theological translator, tells the story of Anthony the Great, a desert father who lived an ascetic life in the third century and is considered the father of monasticism. He was once asked by a philosopher, how do you manage, father, deprived of the consolation of books? Anthony replied, my book is the nature of created things, and this is before me whenever I wish to read the words of God. The first Celtic Christians declared that God is revealed in two books, the little book of scripture and the big book of creation. If you have seen the book of Kells or images of it, you know how sacred the interconnectedness of scripture and wilderness was to their culture. And of course, let's not forget where we started with the psalmist. The first half of Psalm 19 is about the glory of God being revealed in the heavens, the rising of the sun, its path across the sky, and its setting. The striking thing for me about Psalm 19 is that the firmament is not used as a sign or a symbol or a reminder of God's glory. Rather, the heavens are personified and preaching about God's glory. Listen to the verbs here. The heavens are telling, the firmament proclaims, Days pour forth speech. Nights declare knowledge. Verse 3 tells us they do not use speech or words and they can't be heard, yet their voice envelops the earth. In verses 5 and 6, the sun joins in to declare God's glory. My imagination just simply loves how the psalmist gives voice to the celestial sphere. But this is only the first half of the psalm. As the first six verses shine a light on God's glory in the natural world, the rest of the psalm lifts up God's glory in the law. Remember that when the psalmist wrote this, he was referring to the Torah, the laws of God as revealed to Moses and recorded in the first five books of the Bible. In the second part of Psalm 19, the psalmist continues to play with words. As if it is a beautiful vista from a mountaintop, he now speaks of the law as reviving the soul, rejoicing the heart, and enlightening the eyes. Aren't these some of the reasons we go out into nature? To restore our souls, to reclaim joy and feed our eyes with beauty? In our divisive culture, where we have an unhealthy tendency to choose either this or that, Psalm 19 reminds us that more often, we need a both this and that mindset. God speaks to us through both creation and the law to teach us and show us the way. 
When life is good, we tap into both of these resources, reading creation and loving like Jesus. In times when scripture fails to provide comfort for our grief and pain, and we find it difficult to string words together in prayer, we find solace in the spirit-infused wilderness. When nature unleashes her fury through fire, flood, or earthquakes, we live the law by caring for our neighbors in need. The beautiful thing about this psalm is that it reminds us that the law is part of God's creation, part of God's cosmic design. You see, first God infused order into the way living things of land, sea, and sky exist together. Then, through the law, God also infused order into the way humans live together. When asked what is the greatest commandment, Jesus encapsulated the law into three things. Love God, love others, love ourselves. Talk about the Spirit. Simple, but not easy. The psalmist knows we fall short as we endeavor to love like Jesus. So the psalm ends with a beautiful prayer. This is how author Nan Merrill interprets the last three verses. But who can discern their own weaknesses? Cleanse me, O love, from all my hidden faults. Keep me from boldly acting in error. Let my fears and illusions not have dominion over me. Then I shall become a beneficial presence, freely and fully surrendered to your love. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart find favor in your heart, O oh my beloved, my strength and my joy. Amen. Thank you.